Welcome to Choir Talks. My name is Greg O'Neill. I'm the worship pastor at Ridgecrest Baptist Church, and Choir Talks is my weekly podcast. Today, I want to share with you a great story. It's one of my favorite from the Old Testament, and it's one that's near and dear to the heart of Choir Talks because, well, you'll see in a minute that it has something uh, special to do with the choir. Uh, it's found in Second Chronicles 20, and uh, in this chapter, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, and he gets word that there's a vast army, um, that's the words used, a vast army that is just coming to annihilate him. Jehoshaphat had three surrounding countries who were enemies, and they had all joined forces to create a huge army, and they were on their way. So I want us to read this chapter and learn uh, from how he responds. So this is what it sounds like. Uh, after this, the Moabites, Ammonites, and Menuhites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Eden. Uh, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. Now pause just right there. Uh, things we can learn from him. Well, first of all, his first response was not to run, not to go count all his weapons, not to call for allies. His first response here is, as it says, to inquire of the Lord and to proclaim a fast among all of Judah. So I, I love that right off the bat. He knows where to go in times of trouble, and I think that that's a great lesson for us. So he goes to the Lord, and he includes the people of his congregation. He includes the God's people and asks them to, to fast, to be, um, to be serious in prayer. And then he gathers them, and uh, starting in verse 6, he prays. And this is what the prayer starts like. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Now, I like the beginning of this prayer. He focuses right off the bat on the greatness of God. He doesn't jump into God's presence to say, hey, this is what's going on, help me out. He focuses right up, up front on the greatness and the power of God, he, recognizing that no matter how scary the enemy is, God's power is greater. Here's how the prayer ends, which I like even better. He says, uh, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's three great statements that you, you can really just see the humility of this man who was the king, the king of Judah. And yet when he comes before God, he comes with great humility and, and transparency. Listen again, three things he says. We have no power to face this vast army. He's just being real. He's being honest. This is a bigger problem than our own power. And then secondly, he says, we don't know what to do. Now that's transparency. From a king, from the one who is supposed to lead his people, he says, we don't know what to do. This problem is bigger than our understanding, and we don't know what to do. And then finally, this beautiful phrase ends the, ends the prayer. He says, but our eyes are on you. So he brings the problem to the Father, and he says, in humility, this is bigger than us. We don't know what to do, but here's what we are going to do. We're going to put our eyes on you. We're going to trust in you. It's a great prayer of faith. And those three um, phrases are instructional about the way we ought to approach God. So what happens next is God responds to that prayer by sending a word through a prophet that is there in the congregation. In verse 14, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. That's a pretty powerful message from the Father. That must have been so encouraging to hear as God sends this message through this prophet. Um, and yet, it's one thing to hear a word of encouragement, but it's another thing to believe it. And so we see that they did believe it. The next thing that happens is worship. Jehoshaphat responds to that message of God by accepting it in worship. Verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat 
bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. And then some of the Levites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. They fell on their face, and they just began to worship the Father. That shows the faith of Jehoshaphat and his people. They heard the message, and when they believed it, they showed it in faith by coming before the Lord to worship him. Who are these people that stood up to worship him? The, the leaders uh, were called the Kohathites and the Korahites. Who are these people? If you look back in the Old Testament, they are the choir. This is why it's a special part uh, of this story, is special to us as choir leaders. It's the choir who responds here first in faith, and they begin to lead the people to praise the Lord. And they have a special appointed role uh, in the next in the battle. Here it goes in verse twenty. It says, "Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa." As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Israel. Have faith in the Lord, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. And after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, they sang, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Uh, That's the part I love. He put the choir up front to lead into battle. I used to love to point that out to our staff here at Ridgecrest um, because the one place that the the choir is the hero in all of the Old Testament. But they also love to tease me back and say, hey, he put the choir up front because they were the expendable ones. They weren't the warriors. Nevertheless, whatever you believe, the choir was at the front. And here's how God responded when in faith they began to praise. Verse 22, as they began to sing and praise, God set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. So basically what happens is two of the armies begin to attack one of the, uh, the third remaining army. And then after they have finished them off, they begin to attack one another. The Lord sent a spirit of, I don't know, confusion to them or um, rivalry or whatever it was. But he made them to attack one another so that they completely destroyed each other. Uh, In verse 24, it says, When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, they looked toward the vast army and saw only dead bodies. Truly the Lord had been true to his word, and and he fought the battle for them. They did not have to fight at all. Um, It's a great story. Here's the result of it. In verse 25, it says, There was so much plunder left over from the armies that it took them three days to collect it. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, where they praised the Lord. And this is why it's called the Valley of Barakah to this day. So they, the end result is a worship service. They gather together uh, and praise the Lord who has done this mighty thing among them. They do it in a place called the Valley of Praise, or from that time forward, it's called the Valley of Praise. So where are we? Where do we see ourselves? What can we understand from this story? What can we learn? Um, I'm sure like me, you have had a day when you have heard of an army that was on your border. There's been something that has come up against you unexpectedly that seemed overwhelming, something in your life that you knew was bigger than you and, and would be destructive, or maybe multiple things like him, like the three armies in his case. As Christ followers, we have an enemy, and that enemy is determined to bring about our dis- destruction. And uh, there are going to be moments in this life when there's something scary, something bigger than we know that we can handle. Here's what Jehoshaphat did, and let's let's think through these things. He sought God first as his only defense. Secondly, he prayed. And then he acknowledged God's power and his own dependence on God. Before the victory was evident, he expressed his faith in coming to worship the Father. And then he praised the Lord during the moment of battle as, he, as they walked directly to the battle. And after the victory, he came back to worship and praise the Lord again and to set up a reminder so that his people could remember uh, what God had done. So in his responses, we see two inward postures and then two outward expressions. Inwardly, uh, he showed humility and he showed faith. And outwardly, he expressed those by prayer and then by praise. I hope today you can take away some 
something from this story of Jehoshaphat and how God won the victory on their behalf. Hey, and remember the choir. And remember the opportunity that we have to praise the Lord, who is our strong and faithful God. Have a great day.